Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my colleagues, uh, on behalf of my colleagues, Elizabeth Bradshaw and Joe Wright, uh, I'm really excited to tell you about this program on congenital heart disease screening that uh, we have been part of over the last couple years. Uh, I got my interest in screening on issues related to heart disease as I prepared for an endowed professorship at Children's. And I couldn't quite figure out what I wanted to screen for, and I started looking at all the possibilities. And I went to a parent. I went to Mona Barmash, who's president of the Children's Heart Information Network, and I said, Mona, I've got to give this talk. They said it has to be good. What should I talk about in screening? What's the big issue that parents have? And this is the quote from Mona back in 2007. Over the 11 years since I started the Children's Heart Information Network, hardly a day goes by when I do not hear from a distraught parent whose child was not diagnosed at birth, leading to tragic or serious lifelong consequences. Kind of hard to not pay attention to that quote. Uh, just about a month ago, Elizabeth and I were down at a uh, government hearing on screening for congenital heart disease, and two, two or three parents got up, and I think they almost had everybody in the room in tears over their children who had died from misdiagnosis of critical congenital heart disease. And I would admit one thing, that over my 25 years at Children's, I have been teaching for failure. Uh, I've been teaching, some of you in the room, uh, that when a child comes to the emergency room in the first week of life in heart failure, that child has critical left heart obstruction or hypoplastic left heart syndrome. I haven't been teaching you or helping you prevent that child from coming to our emergency room. So in this talk that we are giving today, I hope that we will impart up to you the need for screening for heart disease in the nursery. We will get across to you some of the evidence-based recommendations for implementing screening in community hospitals talk to you about what we're doing on the local, state, and national, and now international level to spread this work, and for you to realize or recognize the public health benefit of population best approach to best practice. So here's our question for the group. Physical exam in the newborn nursery accurately detects critical congenital heart disease. True or false? Let's have hands for true. You know, I now figured it out. Paul, where is Paul? <laughs> there was a paralytic in the, uh, in the lunchtime food, and none of you can raise your hands. All right. So the answer is false. And why is it false? Well, the answer is false because this is the time of the transitional circulation. This is a time when many things are changing in that newborn. And I believe, and I think uh, many of you are aware of this, that probably the most important thing that's happening is that closure of the ductus arteriosus and the closure of the foramenal valley. That ductus and foramen, which allows that fetus during the 40 weeks of gestation to develop normally inside the mother's womb, is now going to be taken away. So that a child with missing chambers, missing valves, can develop normally because of the parallel circulation. And it's that transition to a series circulation that puts that child at risk. So can we screen? Should we screen? I'll go back to a very old uh, public health paper that looked at when should we do screening? under what circumstances. And the issue is, is that we should do screening when the incidence is sufficient in the population, when therapy makes a difference, when screening identifies the child before the disease 
becomes symptomatic when the test is a good test. It has acceptable sensitivity or specificity, and it doesn't cost an arm and a leg. So what about congenital heart disease? Well, congenital heart disease is the most common birth defect in children. It affects about eight per uh, thousand live births, and sometimes, depending upon which we, uh, what we count, it can be a, as high as 10 or 15 per thousand live births. And many of these kids will require treatment in the first year of life. Not only is it frequent, but it's potentially lethal. If one looks at the causes of death in the first year of life, uh, congenital heart disease is one of the most common causes of death from congenital anomalies in the children in the first year. So what do we know about it then? Well, we do know one thing is that you have to find it. And finding it in the newborn period is fairly critical. So how are we doing? Well, uh, as of this study in 2004, this is a uh, study in the United Kingdom where perhaps they are the most organized in their approach to prenatal screening. Guess what? A prenatal diagnosis is only made in about one out of four babies. So only one out of four pregnancies does that diagnosis actually get made. Now that's the pregnancy. Some of those women terminate. When you look at actually live births, it's only about one out of 10. And that's a common comment that w we get from families. A child comes to us at a week of age or two weeks of age with a serious problem. They say, I had four ultrasounds during my pregnancy. How come this wasn't found? Okay. So we're not detecting these with prenatal evaluations. Not only are we not getting on the prenatal, they showed in this study that 40% of the time, the babies actually got out of the hospital with pretty significant conditions before they were detected. So you don't get it prenatally, and you don't find it in the newborn nursery. Is that a problem? Sure is. Why is it a problem? Well, how do those babies show up later? They show up in shock. Of the babies that were missed, babies that left the nursery without detection, 43% of them were admitted to the hospital later in shock. What do we know about shock? It's not good for your future. Okay, number one, shock is associated with a higher mortality Recovery from shock and then going on to have heart sur surgery is associated with a higher morbidity and mortality, number one. Number two, if you do survive, because you know our intensivists are pretty good and our surgeons are pretty good. So if you survive that, the problem is how are you going to be in kindergarten, eighth grade, high school? Developmental disabilities are going to be an issue. Well, take it a step further. How about you don't make it to the doctor at all? This looks at the Baltimore Washington infant study that I was part of, gosh, 20 plus years ago. And they looked in our region, and at that time, 10% of the deaths from congenital heart disease in the first year of life were from babies that were not detected. So it does make a difference if you are missed. So how do we screen? Right now, we ask uh, pediatricians, nurse practitioners, uh, osteopaths, a number of different allied healthcare professionals, we ask them to perform a physical exam. How good is the physical exam? In this study by Wren, again back in the United Kingdom, physical exam, cyanosis, auscultation, palpation of pulses, detection was only about 50%. So that's a problem. This is where pulse oximetry screening has come into play. This was a early 
paper by Koppel and their associates in the United States where they looked at screening for congenital heart disease with pulse oximetry and compared it with the screening for hypothyroidism, PKU, and congenital hearing loss. They looked at the frequency of the condition and the, as you see in the circle there, congenital heart disease much is almost twice as common as hypothyroidism, almost five times as common or more than five times as common than PKU. Uh, and yet we don't screen for it. The accuracy was pretty comparable to the other conditions, and the cost of pulse oximetry negligible. I read this and said, they've got to be kidding. Um, what are they talking about using pulse oximetry and finding heart disease? I didn't get it. I don't think a lot of people did get it. Um, I've just known that pulse oximetry is a simple vital sign. It measures the amount of oxygen in the blood. I knew it was non-invasive, I knew it was painless, but how is this going to find heart disease? And what it relies on is the, the issue of the move from the parallel to the series circulation. And as shown, let's see, this is here on this uh, heart here, the normal adult circulation where the systemic venous return comes to the right ventricle and out to the lungs so that the blue blood is on the right side and then the pulmonary venous return which is fully saturated between 99 and 100% returns to the left side and out to the body. Well if we look at the neonate here in the transitional circulation, oftentimes as you know the neonate may have a little patent ductus arteriosus. But in a normal neonate at 24 hours of age, that patent ductus arteriosus should be shunting left to right. In other words, blood from the aorta should go towards the pulmonary artery. Blood from the pulmonary artery should not be going to the aorta. And so the child should be fully saturated. So the saturation should be 98% or greater. Let's contrast that with transposition of the great arteries our most common cyanotic heart condition in neonates. And this condition shown on this panel here, and we have the right atrium again, the right ventricle, and here we give rise, the right ventricle gives rise to the aorta. So this is the aortic valve. In the left side of the heart, the pulmonary venous blood returns to the left ventricle and then goes out to the pulmonary artery again. So the pink blood returns to the lungs and the blue blood goes to the body. This child is quite blue and will have a failing saturation at 65%, sometimes less. Or hypoplastic left heart syndrome, our most severe abnormality in the newborn period where there is a right side of the heart that's enlarged, the big right ventricle, and the right ventricle gives rise to the aorta, the aorta, I'm sorry, to the pulmonary artery, and the pulmonary artery gives rise to the pulmonary circulation, but also to the systemic circulation through the ductus here. So that a mixture of blue and pink blood is going out to the aorta, and how blue or how pink you are depends upon how much pulmonary venous uh, return there is. And in these children, they are a little bit pinker, which makes it very hard for the pediatrician to detect it. They have a saturation of 90%. Oftentimes, you are unable to detect this level of uh, desaturation in a newborn. So that's how it, that's the theory behind it. Well, does it work? These are, uh, this was from a meta-analysis that looked at all of the uh, common studies back that up to 2007. And these are what are called rock curves. And a rock curve has both the sensitivity and specificity noted on it. But they do the specificity as a false positive, so a, a low number is good uh, rather than uh, bad. And if a test, if we just simply take a line across here at rate the, and split it, that would be a 50-50 line. And that is, uh, the, the, if you toss a coin up in the air and heads or tails, you will have a test come out on this 50 on the 50-50 line here. But if you have good sensitivity, you are going to be up in this quadrant. And if you have good specificity, you should be in this quadrant. So we look at 
test, we look to have sensitivity above 60 or 70 percent, and we look for specificity or a low false positive rate, and we like that the false positives to be in the 1 or 2 uh, percent rate. So you can see using saturation of 95 percent, uh, pulse oximetry performs pretty well. And this, on this side, uh, what the authors did is they looked at all the different levels. Uh, some, some studies have used both a, a foot and an arm and looked for 90, greater than 95 percent as normal or a 3 percent difference between the arms and legs as a problem. And then they looked at the sensitivity and specificity there. The bottom line is pretty good sensitivity and specificity. There are clearly some uh, false positives, and there are clearly some false negatives with pulse, pulse oximetry. It is not a perfect test. Uh, but I think what we have seen with it is that it is, does meet uh, many of the uh, criteria from this World Health Organization paper as far as uh, disease importance and acceptable sensitivity and specificity and cost effectiveness. So why haven't we done anything? And I think the problem is here. It's been the cardiologist. Um, and I, I think that the reason this has not become more widely available is that cardiologists have not supported it. Cardiologists have been concerned that there will be false positives uh, and they will be bothered by excessive consults in nurseries. Uh, cardiologists and neonatologists have said that people in community hospitals cannot do a pulse ox accurately. Um, uh, I'm just reporting it, uh, and I, I, I do have a union card for the cardiologist, and I, uh, and I, I would I have to say that I, I have come to terms with this, and I now say I'm sorry for uh, uh, my, my brethren. Um, so, and this was brought out in this paper by Klitzner and his colleagues where they did a survey. And the bottom line is, uh, I don't think the cardiologists have looked at this in the right way. Uh, the American Heart Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics tried to help, uh, and uh, they looked at this, and they, all the same uh, meta-analysis and database searches, and again, that sensitivity that they showed right around of, uh, 70%, good positive predictive value, false positives right around 0.03%. So, you know, three per thousand kids with a false positive, that's not so bad. Uh, their conclusion was clear that congenital heart disease is not detected in some infants. Failure to detect is a problem. Pulse oximetry may help. Uh, doing it has little risk of harm. And what they said is, can we do some studies in a larger population to see how implementation goes? I thought it was brilliant. At the same time that they published this, two studies came out in Europe. This is one of them, showing this is in, um, in, uh, by Grinelli and their colleagues. And they looked at some uh, almost 40,000 newborns. Again, look at that, sensitivity above 80 percent, spe specificity 97 percent. But more importantly, what are the false positives? The false positives are other more milder forms of heart disease, PPHN, transitional circulation, infections, pulmonary pathology, some of the babies had pneumonia, pneumothoraces, it is not normal to have a saturation of 92 percent for a newborn. If it's not the heart disease, it's something else. So we are denying a simple vital sign to guide the care of newborns. So what I'd like to do now is introduce my associate, uh, Elizabeth Bradshaw. She is the program di director for our uh, screening program, and she's going to talk about our implementation efforts in this community and uh, internationally. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Um, so in light of the AHA and AAP recommendations for additional research on implementation, um, Children's National and Holy Cross Hospital have partnered together to look at just that. What do community hospitals face? What barriers do they face when they implement pulse ox screening 
in their newborn nursery. Um, so Children's um, Heart Institute worked with Holy Cross, worked with leadership, from leadership down to bedside staff at Holy Cross to um, develop and implement a research protocol that was evidence-based, um, based on the research that we, that Dr. Martin just reviewed. Um, and we began enrollment in January of 2009. We knew that large academic centers could implement screening, but we wanted to find out if smaller community hospitals could do it. Um, our aims were to, were to determine if um, a pulse ox screening could be, could be implemented in a large community hospital. We wanted to identify obstacles that would be encountered while performing pulse ox screening. And we wanted to determine the number of participants with critical congenital heart disease that would be found. And lastly, we wanted to um, evaluate the effectiveness of the maternal consent process in actually informing mothers of the purpose behind pulse ox screening. So a question for you all. Implementing a screening program requires how many additional staffing positions? Zero. <laughs> okay, we'll get to the answer in a few minutes, but that's correct. Um, so a, a, an overview of our methods. Uh, we did a pulse ox on the right hand and the right foot um, of each infant following 24 hours of age, and we chose to do it in conjunction with the PKU screen. Um, the PKU was standard of care, is standard of care, um, and is already done, you know, following 24 hours of age, so we felt that it would fit nicely. Um, the passing pulse ox stats was anything greater than 95%, and then referring pulse ox was equal to or less than 95%. Um, we also did a 3% differential between the, between the right hand and the right foot. Um, if the baby was referred, the pediatrician was alerted by the nurse, and an echo and cardiology consult was recommended. So we also tracked the number of um, infants that were enrolled to, the, to those that were actually screened, the time per screening, the obstacles to screening, and the maternal, maternal recall of consent. These are our preliminary findings. Um, we actually just, just, fin just finished enrolling patients yesterday. Um, but through the first year, we screened, six, or we enrolled 6,700 participants. We actually screened 97% of those. We had three false positives, two inconclusive um, findings. The inconclusive findings were babies that were referred, but the pediatrician didn't feel that they needed additional testing, so we're not real sure if those were true positives or true negatives. Uh, we had four false, or I'm sorry, four true positives for, for congenital heart disease, two true positives for critical CHD, and two true positives for non-critical CHD. Our screening time was approximately four minutes. Um, the average SAT was 98 to 99%, and our obstacles to screening were high volume days and early discharges. And approximately 90% of all the mothers, um, or I'm sorry, of the mothers who, who, were, who were asked um, were able to recall the purpose of the screening. So from our findings at Holy Cross, we've put together the congenital heart disease screening program. Our mission is to um, detect congenital heart disease early, before 24 hours, and our vision is that all babies will, will be detected before um, they leave the nursery. We've put together an evidence-based toolkit that has all the materials that, um, that hospitals or nurseries need um, to implement a screening program. We are recommending um, pulse ox done following 24 hours of age. We are, we're actually only recommending pulse ox of the lower extremity, the right leg. Um, we found with, the, with our research that there was confusion with a 3% differential. We also found that all of our false positives resulted from the 3% 3, 3 differential. So um, as we move forward and implement in other organizations, we're only using the one measure of the right leg. Um, we're keeping the 95% as our cutoff, and um, after, if, if a baby is referred, we leave all the additional testing to the discretion of the pediatrician. So thus far, we've, um, our toolkit was complete in January of 2010, and thus far we've had a good, um, good response. We've had 
organizations and advocacy groups in 13 different states request, request toolkits. Um, interestingly, I've just begun um, receiving requests from pedi pediatrician offices who are interested in screening at their first well baby visit. Um, in our area, we're implementing in these organizations. Um, Holy Cross Hospital just went live with standard of care yesterday, and Shady Grove um, began at the beginning of uh, late June, I'm sorry, or I'm sorry, late May, um, and we're working with the other organizations. Georgetown should, should start screening very soon, too. Um, we've also started screening in the Middle East. Um, Dr. Martin and I had the opportunity to go to Kuwait and Qatar about a month ago, and we um, are now screening in three organizations in the Middle East. Now I'd like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Joseph Wright, who's the Senior Vice President of the Children's Health Advocacy Institute. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, this is a very exciting project, and I'd like to close this afternoon's session to talk a little bit about um, what we are doing and, and, more importantly, what lies ahead with regard to really disseminating this work and, and building in the advocacy element. Um, Many of you are aware that uh, my background is as an emergency physician, and I'll just share this, this parable, which really speaks to what uh, Gerard was talking about a little earlier with the way that these children present. It goes, uh, and I'll paraphrase, a man is standing by a river when he hears a cry for help. He sees someone struggling in the water on the verge of drowning. Being an expert swimmer, he jumps in and rescues the victim. Before he has chance, a chance to rejoice in his success, however, he sees someone else floating by also crying for help. He discovers a third, a fourth, and a fifth um, individual in the water, taxing his swimming stamina. Finally, he walks away. When asked where he's going, I'm going up the river to stop people from falling in. So clearly, the opportunity with this work, with this project, to get upstream and truly make a difference is, uh, is a major part of not just the clinical screening program, but the opportunity to identify these children before they fall into the river and um, uh, present to us in the emergency department. A question for the group. How many states have actually enacted legislation to mandate what appears to be a very efficacious practice of universal newborn screening for congenital heart disease? Anyone want to venture a guess? Good. Okay. They're, they've woken up, Gerard. Okay. I, I think it's getting close to cocktail time. Yes, in fact, uh, and even in the one state, uh, it's actually zero to one, in the one jurisdiction where there was passage of legislation to support this practice, it was an unfunded mandate, and we heard, um, we actually uh, were able to conduct a webinar, national webinar back in February, and we, we uh, heard from the folks from Tennessee, uh, and notably they were uh, on our map there as um, uh, folks who have requested our toolkit. and. And it's very exciting to be able to work with folks who have been down this path and be able to share our lessons learned. So at the, at the medical center, we mostly live below this broken dotted line. When you talk about prevention, something has had to happen for you to come into a hospital. Uh, to, in secondary prevention, we talk about preventing illness and s symptoms from progressing to illness. And, and illness from progressing to disability in terms of tertiary prevention and quaternary care obviously occurs in the medical center setting. But what this collaboration between the Children's Heart Institute and the Child Health Advocacy Institute has allowed us to do is to really get upstream, really get to primary prevention, really get beyond uh, what is happening at, at the hospital level to begin to, uh, in this case, screen before uh, we have infants who are presenting um, into, uh, into the hospital. And why is this important? Why is it important to build advocacy into a project like this? Uh, well, it's uh, uh, a community benefit, obviously, uh, but when you talk about uh, an institution, a not-for-profit, large me academic medical center like Children's Hospital, you really have to begin to talk about what the corporate responsibility is. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how this work actually fulfills our mission, not only our advocacy mission, 
but also fulfills our requirement as a, a 501c3 not-for-profit uh, medical center. I'll also talk a little bit about um, the, the implementation of the collaboration between our two centers and, and having this project uh, uh, be disseminated to other, other places. So broadly defined, advocacy is to compensate for the fundamental vulnerability of being a child. They don't vote. We have to be advocates for them. Makes sense. Um, however, in terms of what uh, uh, pediatricians can do and, and, and actually do on a daily basis, certainly in terms of advocacy on the uh, individual advocacy on behalf of individual patients and families, which goes on every day in offices and, and, and clinics and, and, and departments, outpatient departments all over the area, but really beginning to uh, move upstream to be engaged in advocacy at the community hospital level like this project and finally where we really want to go is to be able to make a broad stroke difference at a legislative and a regulatory level and and really being able to uh, get involved in, at all three levels of advocacy is something that this project is affording us an opportunity to do so what are some of the strategies that uh, are being employed with regard to the congenital heart disease screening program uh, you heard about the toolkit development. You've heard about the request for this toolkit to help other uh, community hospitals begin to employ the same approach that uh, was, was enacted at Holy Cross Hospital. Uh, Gerard talked about the involvement and engagement of professional organizations. I mentioned that in February uh, we had an opportunity to conduct a, a national webinar where we heard from folks from all over the country uh, with regard to their experiences with this work and, and uh, was really a valuable uh, two-way experience. And where we are now is uh, now that we have evidence, uh, there is the opportunity, particularly here in the state of Maryland, where we have some strong relationships with the state legislature, to begin to, uh, and, and mind you, we, we actually teed this up almost two years ago invited Gerard to come with us to Annapolis during a um, legislative session in early January to pitch this idea. And uh, so we've been at this uh, for a couple of years in terms of uh, really uh, generating interest among our legislative partners. And, and at this point, um, we are embarking on a strategy that would, in fact, mandate this screening at the level of the newborn nursery. But what's really cool about it is that we have places that are voluntarily coming on board, and this is absolutely the best approach. Uh, when, you, when you say a mandate, that always has a connotation with it. Uh, but when we have hospitals throughout the region that are, are, are voluntarily coming on board, um, this will make our job easier come next legislative session. And, and, and just uh, as I wrap this up, when you talk about the the three E's of prevention, it breaks down into engineering, education, and enforcement. These are the strategies that, that really allow any kind of approach to be effective. And, uh, and I'd like to share with you uh, how this applies to the uh, congenital heart disease screening program. In terms of engineering, you heard Elizabeth talk about the feasibility, the fact that we're able to use a non-invasive and inexpensive screen um, and uh, we have already demonstrated in Gerard's uh, um, Center of Excellence the value uh, of teleechocardiography as a, a national access model. And the same thing can be applied here in terms of this project. In terms of education, a call to action. Uh, Gerard is absolutely right. Uh, the pediatricians and the AAP have been at the forefront of of really calling for this screening and bringing the, the subspecialty community along. And Gerard has been very active uh, with both the American College of Cardiology and the uh, American Heart Association to really break down uh, those barriers and, and those concerns that he's talked about on the part of the subspecialty community because this just makes sense. Uh, you can also visit uh, on our website uh, they call it a landing page. I'm not, you know, I'm not up on the uh, lingo, but there is a actual landing page uh, on the website for this project. Um, Elizabeth talked to you about that, and I encourage you to visit it. Uh, it's a, a way to uh, become more aware yourself and also to educate colleagues. And then finally, in terms of the enforcement aspect of um, uh, the prevention strategy, I mentioned that the next steps 
uh, will be to share, now that the, uh, the evidence collection part, the research component of the project is complete, we can share with elected officials and other stakeholders through briefings, and the best time to do that is now, before they get into session. And then uh, in the state of Maryland, um, a session will begin at the beginning of January, so we have work to do over the summer before they go back in to um, uh, really bring them up to speed. But I have to say that uh, this is a, a project that, that has uh, um, a lot of traction already, and I'm truly hoping that we do not have to necessarily go the legislative route. As, as Elizabeth said, we have demonstrated that this can be added on to existing practice for screening in newborn nurseries without necessarily creating a law. And, uh, and I would suggest that that is the, uh, the best way for us to go with this. So finally, uh, I mentioned that uh, what we are about is uh, discovery delivery of a best practice in this case, and then disseminating it. And, and clearly, this is, project is an opportunity to do just that through the uh, research efforts going on in the Children's National Heart Institute. We're able to promote a best practice and then disseminate it at the community level and then evaluate its impact on, on the community. And um, um, I would be remiss if I, if I didn't again mention that this is the kind of project that uh, permits Children's National Medical Center or any medical center to fulfill their obligation to perform community benefit. This is clearly something that will um, have public health value. It'll get to what we term population health, which is a major component of our, our new strategic plan at the medical center, and I'm very excited to um, be a part of it. So, any questions? I think, Mark, we, we, we may have uh, caught up a little bit here, so. And, and anyone, I, I mentioned uh, very quickly the fact that uh, for those of you who do practice in the state of Maryland, uh, we, we conduct um, a series of dinners at the beginning of the legislative session with all of the delegations um, in the primary service area. So I, I'm talking about the Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Southern Maryland, um, Anne Arundel County delegations, and, and any of you who are, um, are close to elected officials or, or, or legislators, policymakers in those areas, uh, that you can uh, be an advocate for this work and, and educate them, uh, we'd be most appreciative. Um, through uh, the um, uh, CNHN and CPNA practices, we do um, invite leadership to participate with us in those dinners, and, and uh, so please stay tuned. And I would uh, just, oh, I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead. Uh, once, if, if for the, I was really kind of sad that there were more hands up for the second part of the question, which was hospitals that aren't involved, and you may be saying, how come you didn't approach us? Uh, you know, I, first of all, I, would want to thank Holy Cross Hospital because you know they've really been a leader in newborn screening and so it was just kind of a natural to go there uh, they had done the hearing screening and and other screenings that they'd been really national leaders on so we kind of went to them and um, and then the pediatricians that go between Holy Cross and Shady Grove came to us and said hey how about us so then it became that really the pediatricians that were going between the hospitals decided they didn't want just half of their population being dealt with at one hospital. So that kind of forced that. And, um, and so that's kind of how we got started at those two hospitals. We have every other hospital's uh, name and are, we're working with our neonatologist to try to get out. But uh, um, if you are interested, we would love a champion at those organizations. So. Just so you know, there was a strategy in our heads, so I'm sorry to interrupt That's your okay. question. Um, I'm Persita Ellis. I'm a pediatrician, pediatrician in Lexington, Virginia, which is actually outside of this catchment near Roanoke. It's kind of a rural area. And my question is actually this particular topic kind of hits to me because in 2003, one of my coworkers had discharged a little baby at 26 hours of age from the nursery. I was on call that night. Baby came back 18 hours oh, wow. later in shock and it ended up being hypoplastic left heart. My question is, when you were talking about, and I think it was the nurse practitioner who was talking about implementing it and being worried about the early discharges, 
Is there any difference in doing the Paul Sox, for instance, at the same time that you do the PKU, which we always say, child must stay until 24 hours after the first feeding. Is there any difference between doing it at that as opposed to doing it 48 hours later in terms of you know, increased um, sensitivity or anything like that? Because otherwise, I think we would definitely want to implement this. So the, the research is ongoing about when is the best time. We know that in the first day of life, you have an under 24 hours, certainly in the first 12 hours, the number of false positives are up. And that's the transient shunting at the atrial septum or the ductal level. So we, we've chosen 24 hours as kind of our magical number. Uh, but there are other research efforts looking right at that. There's really some great work being done in, in, uh, in, in Europe uh, on that, th this issue of when. I think whether it's 24 or 48, I, I can't say, it, you know, a difference. But uh, so we've, we've chosen 24 hour uh, to avoid false positives. Thank you. Um, hi. Hey, Joe. Hi, Kathy. Uh, we trained together a million years ago. Anyway, is there a reason for a practice to have a toolkit if we're competent at pulse oximetry? Uh, I'm thinking we need to institute this when we see our we see our babies on day three of life usually if they go home on day two in the office. So your your question is: Is there a reason to to actually request the toolkit? Right, as if opposed already, to just doing the pulse ox uh -huh. and using the data to guide our decision. Yeah, well, the, the toolkit is really designed for folks who are trying to implement a, a program. It sounds like, Kathy, that in your practice, you, you've already incorporated this as, as, as part of uh, what you do. Uh, the, the real purpose of the toolkit, and especially for uh, nurseries, remember, this, this project is, is aimed at newborn nurseries. Uh, is designed to implement the project at the at the newborn nursery. Now, where you see your newborns is where we really want you to um, have them implement the toolkit. Well, that's Hopkins, and I think Hopkins is doing this. But do we have them, Gerard? I don't. I don't know about Hopkins. They were. What they I would were say doing it. Up they were doing it about three years ago, and they've continued to okay. do it. Well, that's fantastic. They just didn't publish it. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. what we would ask of you is, if you'd like, is, is go to the website, and we can give you the website. What we'd love for you to do is, if you find someone, to mm -hmm. send us a note and to say that you found it. What we're trying to do is to create a network of screening people, and, and positive results are huge. Mm 